السلام عليك يا رسول الله حبيب الله السلام عليك يا رسول الله حبيب الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته to all the viewers welcome back to British Muslim TV you're watching Sira live from the Wakefield studio with myself Imam Muhammad Abu Bakr Salim you're watching live on Sky 752 you can also watch live on Facebook or Twitter at British Muslim TV as always if you have any questions or comments on the topic of Sira then do get in touch and messages on WhatsApp on the number on your screen 07 585-835-150. So before we continue, last week we continued with the story of the assassination of Kaab ibn Ashraf, who was a rich Jewish man who was causing issues for the Muslim community in Medina. Now Muhammad ibn Maslama radiallahu ta'ala anhu alongside a few other companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam assassinated him in the middle of the night on the command of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we also mentioned that it was due to a number of reasons that the command was given for his assassination. Firstly, being treachery. Second, his foul-mouthed statements against the Muslims. Third, instigating violence and inciting people to attack the Muslims and for the most serious crime was an assassination attempt on the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that's the reason why when the Banu Nadir when they came to complain to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam right about this assassination that look what the Muslims have done they were unable to defend Gab when they were told these reasons for his assassination, right? So, and then we started to look at the marriage of Fatima and Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, one of the joyous occasions after the battle of Badr. So we mentioned that Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he approached the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to ask for Fatima's hand in marriage upon the advice of Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. Right? However, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him that, look, if you, do you have anything to give as dowry? And because he didn't really have anything, he replied, you know, so I have nothing, right? I can't, I don't have anything for this marriage. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then told him to use the armor and shield that he had received from the spoils of Badr as the dowry payment and to use that as uh, you know the, the expenses for the marriage so continuing from there so the prophet sallallahu has told ali now that look take the armor and the and the shield use that as the dowry and for the expenses of your marriage now you see one thing to mention here is that armor was quite uh, quite was was quite an expensive thing at the time right it was because it wasn't very easy and not not everybody had armor right so it was it was uh, it was one of those things which were in demand. So he could he could easily get rid of it, right? Sell it and get money, use that as dowry, and also um, get you know use that to um, fulfill the expenses that there may be. So the Prophet was told Ali this. Now Ali radiallahu ta'ala he leaves from the Prophet sallallahu So he's gone from there, listening to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He goes home. He gets his shield and his armor and he goes towards the marketplace to sell both the shield and, and the armor. Now, on the way there, right, he, he had probably just reached the marketplace where he met Hazrat Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Right? Now, Hazrat Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu saw him that he's come with his shield and armor, etc. Uh, so, most likely, he's probably selling it. So, he asked Ali that, look, are you, are you here to sell these? So he, he said to Hazrat Uthman that, yes, I'm selling these. So Hazrat Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he bought the shield and armor from Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu for around about four to five hundred dirhams, which is, you know, more than enough. So he sells this to Uthman for four to five hundred dirhams. But subhanAllah, you see, Allahu Akbar, 
Hazrat Uthman radiyallahu ta'ala was another amazing individual, subhanallah, right? What he did was, he bought the shield and armor, gave the four, five hundred dirhams to Hazrat Ali radiyallahu ta'ala, right? He's done this. The transaction is complete. Then he asks Ali radiyallahu ta'ala, look, this shield and armor belongs to me now, right? It's clarifying with him, right? Ali says, yes, this belongs to you now. And then he says, that money that you've got in your hand is rightfully yours, correct? Because obviously you've sold something and you've taken it in exchange for that. And then he said, yes, this money is rightfully now mine. So the whole, basically, Uthman is trying to clarify and, you know, confirm that this transaction is now complete. That money is yours, finished. It's not mine no more. And this shield is mine. It's not yours no more, right? And there's a reason why Uthman is doing this. Right. So he confirms this, he's classified Ali, the transaction is now complete. And then subhanAllah, Allahu Akbar, as Uthman radiallahu ta'ala, he then looks at Ali and he says to Ali, Oh Ali, here, take this shield and armor as a wedding gift from me. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You know, he, he's given the four, five hundred dirhams and now he's giving back the items as well. Actually, I shouldn't be saying giving back. He's gifting back the items to Ali radiallahu ta'ala, subhanAllah. And, and as a wedding gift, Allahu Akbar. You see, this is, this is how the companions and the Muslims of that era helped each other, right? Those with more, those that had more and they had wealth, they would look after those with less, right? They wouldn't turn their faces away from them. They wouldn't think we're too good to be with them. They used to look after them. They helped each other as though they were truly blood brothers, right? Allahu Akbar. In fact, you know, subhanAllah, the way they used to treat each other, it was more than blood brothers, Allahu Akbar, right? You know, subhanAllah, you know, when we see in today's day and age, right, if a, pers if a person has wealth, he doesn't want to look at somebody who has no wealth, right? We think we're too good for the other person, subhanAllah. And here, Allahu Akbar, this companions, they had more, they would look after, they would help whatever possible. Allahu Akbar, subhanAllah. Where has that generosity and care gone for, for our Muslim brothers and sisters? So, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Right? We don't see that anymore. And this is how the companions, Allahu Akbar, were. So anyways, Adil Usman gives the money and also gives the shield and armor back to Hazrat Ali, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then he... Uh, and then he comes back to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and tells Hazrat, uh, uh, the Prophet sallallahu that this is what Hazrat Uthman has done. And so far you see the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told told when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam heard this from Hazrat Uthman uh, from Hazrat Ali radiallahu taala, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then made du'a for Uthman radiallahu taala and Subhanallah, right? Allah So anyways, so this whole thing is done. Shields being sold and being gifted back, Allahu Akbar. Now, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, obviously the Prophet has, has had this conversation with Ali, right? Now, Ali's proposed, the Prophet is happy with the proposal, but that wasn't it. The Prophet then went and actually asked Hazrat Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha about this as well, right? It wasn't that the Prophet has met with Ali and Prophet's happy with the proposal, that's it, the marriage is going to go ahead, no. The Prophet went and asked Fatima about this proposal. That look, are you happy with this proposal as well? And it was out of shyness, right? Out of shyness, as a Fatima, she remained quiet. And the Prophet took her silence as approval, right? And then not only did he take it as approval, he then actually assured her and he, and he, and he consoled, not, he assured her that look, my daughter, right? This is for, this I'm doing for, the, for, you, for your best, right? And then the Prophet says that, oh, my beloved daughter, right, be calm, for I have married you to the most beloved of my household to me. Right? So, so this person, <coughs> this person that you're getting married to is no ordinary person. It isn't anybody that I've just, you know, got from the, from the streets or, you know, any Muslim I've just chosen to be, to be, to be your husband. It is the person who is the most beloved of my household to me, subhanAllah, right? Allahu Akbar. So Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he's sold his shield, he's received it back as a gift, he's got money now as well. He's come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
and now using that money and that uh, and, and the shield and armor the nikah was done by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam now at the time haza ali radiyallahu ta'ala anhu didn't have his own private place where he would stay right so he rented a house and took his new bride to live in that house right so he did initially he didn't have anything now they've rented a house and they're living in that house but what both of them wanted was they actually wanted to be closer to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so fatima radiyallahu ta'ala anha she requested the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that oh prophet of allah could you please ask haritha ibn nu'man for a house closer to uh, closer right to 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 yours right uh, because you see the narrations mention that Harith ibn Nu'man radiyallahu ta'ala anhu was an individual who owned quite a few houses around Masjid al-Nabawi right and he actually had offered his properties to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for use as well if if ever if there was ever a need so as a fatima knew this and that's why she asked the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that look uh, you know can you request him to maybe vacate one of the houses for us so we can move closer so we can be closer to you but subhanallah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied to hazrat fatima that look oh fatima you know as much as i would love to but you see harith ibn nu'man he's moved for me on a number of occasions right so many times i've asked him and and i feel embarrassed to ask him again right subhanallah so the prophet says this and and then that was that finish end of conversation but subhanallah allahu akbar somehow this news it reached hazrat haritha radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and immediately as soon as he heard this that this incident has happened as haritha he came straight to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said ya rasul allah o messenger of allah i have heard that you would like as a for haza fatima and ali to move close to you right uh, this news has reached me and then he says to the prophet ya rasul allah everything i own belongs to you these were the companions allahu akbar <coughs> so he says to the person everything i own belongs to you my wealth and me my body my wealth and i we are all for the sake of allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he says that ya rasul these houses of mine right these houses these few that are here they are the closest to your home right and then he says ya rasulullah these are the ones that are here so please take any of them that you wish whatever you leave for me will be dearer to me than anything else subhanallah allahu akbar <coughs> so this is what hazrat harith ibn nu'man says that ya rasulullah anything you want to take take and then whatever you don't take alhamdulillah i'm happy with that right subhanallah so even if prophet sallallahu wanted to take each and every one of the properties he was happy to give that allahu akbar see again you know that that the love that these companions had for the deen they had for rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was amazing right allahu akbar it's something which you know we rarely we rarely see in today's day and age allahu akbar and what happens next inshallah we'll continue after this short break Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back after the short break. So just before the break we were just mentioning regarding Hazrat Haritha ibn Nu'man radiyallahu ta'ala anhu that he came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and offered his houses so that Hazrat Ali and Fatima could move closer to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So anyways this you see this this wedding of Hazrat Ali radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and Hazrat Fatima radiyallahu ta'ala anha it was such a simple Uh, it was such a simple wedding right the bride and groom both didn't have much right subhanallah today how much have we strayed from the an adulterated concept of nikah right as an act of worship right and the simplicity in the celebrations subhanallah right the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam actually says the marriage which produces 
the most, the, uh, the, the marriage which produces the most blessings is that which involves the least amount of burden, right? Subhanallah. The expectations, unfortunately, that we have set today has made marriage a huge burden, right? To afford the luxury venue, the supercars that, you know, you want to get for every single guest, the thousands of guests that we want to invite, right? Most people, because of that, most people, they start their married life in debt. Allahu Akbar, right? If somebody doesn't, and if somebody doesn't splash, you know, huge amounts of cash and have a huge luxury wedding, then unfortunately, subhanAllah, they, they, they look down upon, right? In society, they, they, they'll start to be, oh, look at them, they did so and so in their wedding, Allahu Akbar, right? SubhanAllah, where, where has this come from, right? Where has, where, where has you know, this, this whole concept come from where we have to splash a stupid amount of cash on a wedding where it takes you into debt, Allahu Akbar, right? The Prophet says that the most blessed marriage is the one which has the least amount of burden, right? Allahu Akbar. And, you know, subhanAllah, this, this whole concept of huge splashing money and luxury cars and luxury venues, this is something which, you know, it, we need to change this culture, right? It, it, we need to change it because it's only making marriage more and more difficult for our future generations, right? And you see, and another thing is that this whole culture is not from amongst the teachings of Islam. This is something we have brought in ourselves, unfortunately, right? Now, I just want to mention that, look, it's, don't misunderstand. If somebody has the money, somebody has the cash, somebody, you know, Allah has given, blessed him with wealth, right? And he can afford to have a luxury wedding. There is absolutely no harm in having a luxury wedding. But for somebody, right, who doesn't have, as much for them to go into debt and then for society to you know to, to to look down upon them and to kind of kind of force them to you know have a luxury wedding is absolutely wrong and in fact even those that have wealth we should still be encouraging to have more simpler weddings right now so this this was the marriage of Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu with Hazrat Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, the beloved daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as mentioned, this was a very simple wedding that happened after the Battle of Badr. Now, one of the most successful campaigns after the Battle of Badr which happened before the Battle of Uhud, was Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu ta'ala anhu's attack on a Meccan caravan just a few months before Uhud. So, now, you see, one thing to understand, we've mentioned this in the past as well, was that, see, the Meccans, the Quraysh, and, and not just the Quraysh, the, all the tribes that were living in and around Mecca, their lives mainly depended on trade caravans. Right. And these caravans would go to Syria, they'd go to Abyssinia and, you know, various other areas. They'd go there, they'd trade, they'd come back and their whole livelihood used to depend on these trade caravans. Right. But the problem was that now what they had to do was to get to all these places. Before it was simple, they would send the caravans and finish. But the problem now was that, was that to reach these places that they would usually trade in, they had to pass Madinatul Munawwara, right? And obviously, after the Battle of Badr, they knew very well that they couldn't do that anymore, right? They couldn't just walk straight past Medina without, you know, and, and thinking nothing will happen, our trade caravans will be absolutely fine, right? Because the whole Battle of Badr, you know, it, it happened on the back of where, you know, a, a caravan was being attacked by the, by the Muslims of Medina. So, because they knew now they can't just send caravans, uh, caravans to uh, you know Syria and uh, Abyssinia, you know, just like that past Medina to Munawwara, they needed to figure out another reasonable route through which they could bypass Medina, right, and ensure the safety of their caravans. Now, they now you see they they had to do this, right? They had to find this escape, right, from the economic blockade that was put in place by the Muslims, right? So what happened was 
the Meccans, the Quraysh, and the other tribes, they, they, they gathered together and they sat down uh, to discuss that, look, what should we do? They convened a meeting, right? They had a meeting. What should, what should be done, right? Because obviously they need to uh, come to some sort of conclusion. They, they need to, you know, decide something because they can't continue. The economy of Mecca will completely, you know, fall. So they sat down and they, they, they had a discussion, right? What should we do now? So it was decided that what they would do is they would use the route that would go through Najd and then into Iraq. So what, what that means is they completely avoid Medina by hundreds of miles, right? Uh, it was a longer route, but it would be safe and they would, you know, they would be content that their, their trading, the, the caravan will reach its destination and come back safely as well, right? So what they would do is they, they, they initially, before Medina was occupied by the Muslims, what they would do is they would simply travel north and that's it, they're in Iraq, okay? And now what they, this route through Najd is, where now they'd have to travel east, quite a distance towards the east, and then up towards north, right? So as I said, longer route, but they were content that this would be safer and their caravans would not be in any type of danger of being looted. Now, so this decision's been made, and now a caravan is, uh, caravans are now setting out towards Iraq and Abyssinia through this new route that they've decided. Now, subhanAllah, Allahu Akbar, unfortunately for the Quraysh and for the Meccans, one of the individuals that was in the meeting, right, he had quite a bit to drink. This is after the meeting, obviously. He had quite a bit to, uh, uh, he had quite a bit to drink. And whilst being drunk, he had actually leaked the information of the route. Right, so subhanAllah. It was supposed to be that those people in the meeting, they knew, and the people that would be leading the caravans, they knew. That's it, nobody else needs to know. But this person, being in the state of drunkenness, he accidentally uh, leaked the information that, oh, by the way, from now on, we'll be taking so and so route. And subhanAllah, you know how news spreads, Allahu Akbar, even in today's day and age, you know, news spreads like wildfire. And so, th so this news spread, right? And subhanAllah, this news reached the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam very, very quickly, right? The Prophet received it within a couple of days that this is what's happening, that they, they're now using a different route, a longer route to avoid you completely. Now, you see, the Muslims, they had this economic blockade for a reason, right? And now they can't, they can't allow the Quraysh or the, uh, the Meccans to, you know, somehow find a way to avoid that, right? And escape that. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he immediately dispatched uh, Hazrat Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, with a, a group of a hundred horsemen to basically uh, intercept this caravan and capture the caravan that has been sent using the new route. And, sub uh, and subhanAllah, the horsemen, obviously they, they rode quite quickly. They, 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 ca they caught up to the caravan and took them by surprise. And the Meccans, subhanAllah, they fled without any sort of fight, right? Uh, but on, for, uh, however, two th they, although they tried fleeing, two or, two or three of them were actually captured uh, and taken as prisoners. And as a result of this attack uh, and this capture, the Muslims were able to continue their blockade on the Meccans and the Quraysh. Now, so this was a very successful, one of the one of the most successful campaigns between Badr and Uhud. Now, you see the Quraysh, the defeat that they experienced at Badr was so embarrassing and humiliating for the Meccans that they had already begun to prepare for another attack later on to restore their uh, reputation and pride. Right, revenge was in everyone's mind and heart right? in fact many 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 of the individuals in Mecca had even promised that they would not mourn the dead until they had taken revenge for those that were lost in Badr those that were killed in Badr right so so this so the preparations for this revenge had actually begun straight after Badr 
right? When they had come back, within a few days, this preparation had started, right? Uh, in fact, narrations actually mention that Abu Sufyan, right? Well, Abu Sufyan, uh, he took him, he, he went around uh, Mecca, right? He went around Mecca with Sufyan ibn Umayyah and Ikrama ibn Abi Jahl. Now, why he took these two was because Sufyan ibn Umayyah and Ikrama Abi, uh, ibn Abi Jahl, they both were the sons of two of the individuals who, uh, you know, uh, who, who were killed, right? Abu Jahl and, uh, and, uh, and Umayyah, right? They were both killed. So these are the sons of, these, uh, of the killed individuals, right? So Abu Sufyan wanted to use that, right? He wanted to use that to kind of build that fire. That look, these are people who've lost their dear ones, right? They've lost their fathers, they've lost their parents, right? So Abu Sufyan, he took Umayyah and Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl across Mecca, right? Uh, and they went around knocking on people's doors. They went knocking on people, people's doors and asking them, asking them to give back all the prophets from the caravan of Badr, right? And they wanted to take that back so that it could be used to purchase equipment and resources, right? Now, you see, the 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 incident the incident we mentioned earlier about the caravan uh, that was intercepted by the Meccans, right? It uh, it's even more hasty, right? Made the Meccans even more hasty in attacking the Muslims because they, they what they thought is we can avoid, right? We can avoid the economic blockade by using a different route. But now this attack has made them realize, you know what? We're in a desperate situation here. We really need to attack. Uh, because there's no other, there's no other way now. We need to attack and finish them off so that we can continue with our livelihood. So, what happens next, inshallah, we will continue uh, next week. So, this brings us to the end of today's episode. If you have any questions or comments for us on this topic, then please do message us on WhatsApp on the number on your screen, zero uh, seven five eight five. 835150. Inshallah, we'll continue from here next week. So please do tune in again next Thursday at 8 30 pm. Until then, stay safe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah, Habib Allah. Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah, Habib Allah.